Neurosurgery is a very competitive specialty to get into, and we've been getting a lot of questions from medical students across the country wondering how they can make their CV much more competitive for when they try to get into the specialty later on. This video is not going to be exhaustive, but I'm going to try and cover some of the major topics and opportunities that you can pursue to make yourself competitive moving forward. So, I'm going to timestamp everything here and in the description. There will be lots of links for you to follow both here and also on an accompanying blog post by Nicola Newell, which you'll find over on our website. Again, links below. I'm going to try and cover each topic broadly. And then if there's more appetite for this, we can go into each one of these in depth in separate videos. The main things that we're going to cover include showing early interest, shadowing experience, experiencing other specialties and why, audits and research projects, special study modules at university, conferences, surgical skills courses, surgery or neurological societies at an undergraduate level, teaching, mini and major electives, and finally the Brain Book Ambassador Programme. I definitely knew that I wanted to be a surgeon from about the second year of university, but I wasn't sure what. I then experienced neurosurgery in my third year of medical school at St George's and from then I knew that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon and so I started gearing up my interest. At medical school, most of the time you will be very regimented in lectures that you have to attend, placements and so on and so forth. But compared to when you're working, there is significantly more free time to try and achieve things. Showing interest early is one of those really important things that will do two things for you. Firstly, it will really make you realise whether this is definitely the specialty for you and B, it will definitely get you into a unit or department and you can start trying to improve your relationships within those departments and get your face seen. A lot of the opportunities that we might talk about later on will come once you've started to show your face and people start to recognise you. If you turn up once to a neurosurgery operating theatre, clinic or go on ward rounds and never go again, A, you're not going to be remembered and B, people are not going to be giving you opportunities. So, if you do have free time and you do want to definitely go and see whether this is a specialty for you, if you're lucky enough to be in a university that's attached to a major trauma centre or neurosurgery unit, just go, go to the morning meetings that tend to be at 8 o'clock in the morning, try and go on ward rounds, try and show your face in theatre and in clinics. But remember, it's not all about the operating theatre. You want to try and get a well-balanced view of what the specialty is like. You do need to go to clinics, you do need to go on ward rounds, and the morning meeting is where the majority of the learning will take place before the day has already started. Now, when we move on to talking about shadowing, it's important to note that you will have set time in your undergraduate curriculum to do neurology and neurosurgery. The problem with this is that it tends to be an extremely short block and you tend to be shunted here, there and everywhere. A lot of the shadowing that you do for neurosurgery will have to be done in your own time. And again, as I mentioned before in showing an interest, you can definitely try and shadow neurosurgeons on call, which is a particularly good time, or in the outpatient department. And the key to this is trying to find someone who is willing to take the time to teach you. But don't be disheartened. If clinics are really busy, or if an on-call is really busy, it may just be a bad time to get lots of in-depth teaching. At that point, do tag along if the surgeon is happy to have you, and try and learn some things by osmosis. Again, remember, the more you turn up, the more you show your face and show that you're keen, the more likely people are to try and invest time in you. We get a lot of people who come and say they want to do neurosurgery and want to spend time with you and then they disappear and never come back. They're probably not focused enough for me to invest a considerable amount of time talking them through things and teaching them, although I will do that as much as I possibly can. Now, experiencing other specialties. When you're at medical school, you will see a lot of different things. You'll see a lot of different types of medicine and a lot of different types of surgery. If you do decide early on that you want to be a surgeon and you want to be a neurosurgeon, you still need to go and see everything else. There are two reasons for this. One is that you're gonna have finals and you need to know that stuff to get through medical school. And B, neurosurgery is a specialty where 
Problems with the brain can impact the rest of the body. You cannot be a good neurosurgeon unless you have a very holistic understanding of how the rest of the body operates and works. Prime examples of this are in severe traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury, where all kinds of autonomic disturbances can manifest. And if you don't know the pathophysiology behind that, and you don't know how that's managed, you're going to have problems as a junior doctor and as a junior neurosurgeon trying to figure out how to fix these things. But from the point of view of applying for neurosurgery, it's important to have your plan A, which is hopefully neurosurgery, your plan B and a plan C. For me, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. So if I didn't get into neurosurgery, my plan B was going to be vascular surgery. And if God forbid something had happened that meant that I couldn't become a surgeon, my plan C was medical and I wanted to be a psychiatrist if I couldn't become a surgeon. So having those plans means that you have a fallback should things go wrong. But the whole point of this video is to make sure that you do get your plan A. Now, audits and research projects. Audits are an important thing to start really early because the whole point of an audit is that you check how something is working or not working within clinical practice, you implement some kind of change, and then you go back later on, whether that's three months, six months, one year later, and see whether that change has affected practice according to national guidance. You can't do that in a month, okay? So don't leave it until you're a house officer and you're about to apply for national selection. Then you're going to be extremely stressed and things are unlikely to work out. Audits require a whole separate video in themselves to explain how they work, but the general principle is that together with a supervisor, you identify a particular part of clinical practice that you want to see how it's working according to national guidance or local protocols. You then need to audit it by going over and seeing how things are working and then based on that data implement some kind of intervention and then come back later on and see whether that has worked. You need to register these audits in the hospital and there are specific departments that do this. And needless to say just starting an audit is something that you can put on your CV, but it's never going to be as good as completing the cycle. That's doing the initial audit, implementing a change, and then re-auditing to see whether things have actually changed for the better or not. If you can do that, that's a really, really good thing for your CV. Research is again another thing that we could spend quite a lot of time talking about, but the two main opportunities you may have are doing an intercalated BSc and doing a research project there, or trying to do it in your own time. I've done both, and I didn't get a publication out of my intercalated BSc, but I did get a lot of transferable skills that I was able to talk about in my application. I also did research in my spare time. Some of that was published and some of it wasn't you need to be prepared to accept that some of the work that you do will not have a tangible outcome. You may not have a final polished publication to show on your CV for it, but you will have the skills and you will have the writing ability and the analytic skills that you can then take on and become more efficient. From my point of view, one of the main tips that I could give you as a medical student trying to do research or get a publication is that you should probably choose your supervisor very, very carefully. There will be a lot of people that throw projects at you who want them to be quick and don't have a specific research question in mind. This may give you a short-term benefit or a short-term publication, but it's nothing that you're going to be able to be proud of and talk about with great gusto during your application. It may seem a little bit cheeky, but one of the main things that you can do is type in your supervisor's name into PubMed and see whether they have some kind of established credibility as a researcher or if they have lots of publications that they've done. What you don't want to see is somebody that's published something six years ago that was of low quality and nothing since. Look for people that have got a high output and a high quality output. You're more likely to get good research skills, good analytical skills, really up the ante with your writing game and get a publication out of it that you're happy to talk about at selection. If you do want to know more about research and audit, pop a comment down below and we'll see if there are enough people that want a full video on this. 
Now, SSCs are special study components or special study modules that your university might offer you at an undergraduate level. If you want to try and organize this within a neurosurgery department, you need to be quite organized and again approach good supervisors early and get a project in mind. These do look good because they show not only that you have written something like a literature review or presented something, but that you are showing a really good early interest in the specialty from an undergraduate level. If your audits and research or SSCs or SSMs do give you some good outputs, and we're talking about good quality data that you'd like to present, the next key thing is to apply to go to conferences. Now, as a medical student, you're quite fortunate because the, because the fees for attending conferences at your level are significantly cheaper than they would be at a postgraduate level. Not only that, but a lot of universities now offer uh, conference funds so that you can attend them heavily subsidized. Now, sometimes that depends on whether you've actually got something to present or not, but definitely look within your university to see if those opportunities exist. Sometimes, if there's something local or national that you'd really like to go to, it's a good idea to just go to the conference. You might learn a lot of things from the presentations that are there, and you might start meeting people and gaining new opportunities. If you've got a buddy that you can go with, that will also really, really help, because then you're not going to feel too intimidated and nervous and may be able to approach people as a pair or a duo. Surgical skills events are run locally, regionally, nationally. There are lots of different people that do them. Your local surgical society will be running these and they're a very good way to A, improve your manual dexterity and your surgical skills, but you'll also get certificates of attendance. Again, these are really good to show early interest in your specialty and they're something tangible that you can put in a portfolio to take with you to selection. These surgical skill courses also often have volunteers who are surgical registrars or neurosurgery registrars. And at this point, this is another good time to try and interact with them and see if they have any further opportunities that they could get you involved with. The main people that do run these courses that are not local are the Association of Surgeons in Training and NANSIG, which is supported by the Society of British Neurological Surgeons. There are lots more, we'll pop them down in the description and in the blog post. Next, we'll move on to societies. Again, at an undergraduate level and at university, there will be lots of different societies at university. And looking at places like Queen Mary now or King's College, there are so many more societies than there ever used to be when I was an undergraduate. There are now neurological societies and surgical societies, anatomical societies, join up to all of them, go to all the lectures, meet the speakers, see what opportunities they have. You'll learn lots of cool and interesting stuff there and you will also probably get the opportunity to present things. Having an abstract presented at one of their meetings will be able to be something you can put on your CV and something that you can talk about. Remember, all of this stuff is helping you show a really early interest in this career and specialty. If you're also presenting something at these society meetings, there will often be prizes to the best abstract, best presentation, etc. These prizes are undergraduate prizes that are a tick box that you can only get as an undergraduate for when you go to selection, okay? So do try and get some of these prizes because otherwise you're gonna have a load of empty boxes in your application. It's not the be all and end all if you don't get these prizes, but it's always nice to be able to show a nice full box of things that you've done. Now, with regards to teaching, this is quite specific to the university that you're at. A lot of people will try and undertake some kind of peer teaching. At St. George's, where I was, I was fortunate enough to be a peer anatomy demonstrator and peer clinical skills tutor. The real benefit of this is that you get proper teacher training. Not only that, but you're teaching on a regular basis and getting regular feedback. Teaching ad hoc, now and again, a little bit here and a little bit there, is not great for your application. It's not great for progressing yourself as a clinical teacher. What you need is to do things regularly and to get constant feedback. You need to keep all of these feedback forms and keep them in your portfolio. This is so, so important. Teaching is a major component of being a doctor and being a surgeon. 
Surgery itself is an apprenticeship. So if you can show that you are a good teacher, that you are able to teach anatomy or that you are able to teach clinical skills well and that you have the written evidence to support this, this is again another major component of national selection. So make sure that you do these things and start them early. Starting and doing this stuff as a peer demonstrator or peer skills tutor as an undergraduate means that you're really bolstering your CV before you even become a house officer. Moving on to mini and major electives. So sometimes during the SSM or SSC periods, some places will let you do mini electives. This is really good if you want to go to another unit or if you're part of a university that doesn't have a major neurosurgical unit attached to it. What this means is that you could spend a period of two, three, four weeks dedicated in a neurosurgery unit and really get a proper depth of experience there. This is going to be good because you're going to be an integral part of the team. You will get opportunities to hopefully publish something or present something, and you're going to experience everything, including outpatient clinics, theatres, ward rounds, morning meetings, and you don't need to worry about anything else. That time is dedicated to you gaining experience of neurosurgery. Again, this stuff is really important to organize early. There's a lot of paperwork around it from what I understand. So talk to people who've done it before. There are lots of people who volunteer at BrainBook who are current medical students who'd be more than happy to help you try and organize something like this. At the Royal London and Queen Mary University, we're also definitely more than happy to have students come and join us for mini electives, SSCs, etc. So do get in contact. For major electives, I think that's something I'll focus on in another video, but again, please do not waste the time by spending what some people call an elective holiday and just going and, and going to Hawaii or the Canaries or something like that for five weeks and not gaining any, anything from it. It might be nice to have a massive holiday, but the whole point of these electives is that you gain experience of other health services, other hospitals, other specialties you can really gain so much. I'll talk about my own elective experience and what I gained from it in another video. But again, you should really leave about a year to try and plan your major elective. There's a lot of funding required. It can be a massive drain on your wallet or purse. And there is a huge amount of admin that you need to do in advance. You need supervisors. You need people who are going to be looking after you, especially if you're going abroad. Don't forget all the little things like vaccinations and so on and so forth. You can't leave this stuff to the last minute. And finally, the BrainBook Ambassador program is a fantastic program set up by three current medical students, Stasha, Nicola and Sasha, who, who are doing a great job in broadening the horizons for medical students across the world who want to get involved in neurosurgery and we're trying to provide as many opportunities to undergraduates, whether they be medical students or neuroscience students. So if you do want to become part of the ambassador program or want to learn more, there's gonna be a link down below or you can email Nicola. Again, you can find Nicola's details on the BrainBook website and apply for the ambassador program there. This was a bit of a whirlwind tour and I hope you found it useful. Drop some comments down below if you want to know anything specifically. Nicola Newell is going to be writing a fantastic blog post that details some more of these things with in-depth sections and links to all of the societies and conferences that you can take part in. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know if there are more videos like this that you want.